Gates of Imagination presents Story of the Physician and the Saratoga Trunk by Robert Louis Stevenson Read by Arthur Lane Mr. Silas Q. Scudamore was a young American of a simple and harmless disposition, which was the more to his credit as he came from New England, a quarter of the New World not precisely famous for those qualities. Although he was exceedingly rich, he kept a note of all his expenses in a little paper pocketbook, and he had chosen to study the attractions of Paris from the seventh story of what is called a furnished hotel in the Latin Quarter. There was a great deal of habit in his penuriousness, and his virtue, which was very remarkable among his associates, was principally founded upon diffidence and youth. The next room to his was inhabited by a lady, very attractive in her air and very elegant in toilette, whom, on his first arrival, he had taken for a countess. In course of time he had learned that she was known by the name of Madame Zephyrin, and that whatever station she occupied in life, it was not that of a person of title. Madame Zephyrin, probably in the hope of enchanting the young American, used to flaunt by him on the stairs with a civil inclination, a word of course, and a knock-down look out of her black eyes, and disappear in a rustle of silk, and with the revelation of an admirable foot and ankle. But these advances, so far from encouraging Mr. Scudamore, plunged him into the depths of depression and bashfulness. She had come to him several times for a light, or to apologize for the imaginary depredations of her poodle, but his mouth was closed in the presence of so superior a being, his French promptly left him, and he could only stare and stammer until she was gone. The slenderness of their intercourse did not prevent him from throwing out insinuations of a very glorious order when he was safely alone with a few males. The room on the other side of the Americans, for there were three rooms on a floor in the hotel, was tenanted by an old English physician of rather doubtful reputation. Dr. Noel, for that was his name, had been forced to leave London, where he enjoyed a large and increasing practice, and it was hinted that the police had been the instigators of this change of scene. At least he, who had made something of a figure in earlier life, now dwelt in the Latin quarter in great simplicity and solitude, and devoted much of his time to study. Mr. Scudamore had made his acquaintance, and the pair would now and then dine together frugally in a restaurant across the street. Silas Q. Scudamore had many little vices of the more respectable order, and was not restrained by delicacy from indulging them in many rather doubtful ways. Chief among his foibles stood curiosity. He was a born gossip, and life, and especially those parts of it in which he had no experience, interested him to the degree of passion. He was a pert, invincible questioner, pushing his inquiries with equal pertinacity and indiscretion. He had been observed, when he took a letter to the post, to weigh it in his hand, to turn it over and over, and to study the address with care, and when he found a flaw in the partition between his room and Madame Zephyrin's, instead of filling it up, he enlarged and improved the opening and made use of it as a spy-hole on his neighbor's affairs. One day in the end of March, his curiosity growing as it was indulged, he enlarged the hole a little further, so that he might command another corner of the room. That evening, when he went as usual to inspect Madame Zephyrin's movements, he was astonished to find the aperture obscured in an odd manner on the other side, and still more abashed when the obstacle was suddenly withdrawn and a titter of laughter reached his ears. Some of the plaster had evidently betrayed the secret of his spy-hole, and his neighbour had been returning the compliment in kind. Mr. Scudamore was moved to a very acute feeling of annoyance. He condemned Madame Zephyrine unmercifully. He even blamed himself. But when he found next day that she had taken no means to balk him of his favourite pastime, he continued to profit by her carelessness and gratify his idle curiosity. That next day Madame Zephyrine received a long visit from a tall, loosely built man of fifty or upwards, whom Silas had not hitherto seen. His tweed suit and coloured shirt, no less than his shaggy side whiskers, identified him as a Britisher, and his dull grey eye affected Silas with a sense of cold. He kept screwing his mouth from side to side and round and round during the whole colloquy, which was carried on in whispers. More than once it seemed to the young New Englander as if their gestures indicated his own apartment, but the only thing definite he could gather by the most scrupulous attention was this remark made by the Englishman in a somewhat higher key, as if in answer to some reluctance or opposition. 
I have studied his taste to a nicety, and I tell you again and again you are the only woman of the sort that I can lay my hands on. In answer to this, Madame Zephyrin sighed, and appeared by a gesture to resign herself, like one yielding to unqualified authority. That afternoon, the observatory was finally blinded, a wardrobe having been drawn in front of it upon the other side. And while Silas was still lamenting over this misfortune, which he attributed to the Britisher's malign suggestion, the concierge brought him up a letter in a female handwriting. It was conceived in French of no very rigorous orthography, bore no signature, and in the most encouraging terms invited the young American to be present in a certain part of the Bullier Ball at eleven o'clock that night. Curiosity and timidity fought a long battle in his heart. Sometimes he was all virtue, sometimes all fire and daring, and the result of it was that, long before ten, Mr. Silas Q. Scudamore presented himself in unimpeachable attire at the door of the Bullier Ballrooms, and paid his entry money with a sense of reckless devilry that was not without its charm. It was carnival time, and the ball was very full and noisy. The lights and the crowd at first rather abashed our young adventurer, and then, mounting to his brain with a sort of intoxication, put him in possession of more than his own share of manhood. He felt ready to face the devil, and strutted in the ballroom with the swagger of a cavalier. While he was thus parading, he became aware of Madame Zephyrin and her Britisher in conference behind a pillar. The cat-like spirit of eavesdropping overcame him at once. He stole nearer and nearer on the couple from behind, until he was within earshot. That is the man, the Britisher was saying, there, with the long blonde hair, speaking to a girl in green. Silas identified a very handsome young fellow of small stature, who was plainly the object of this designation. It is well, said Madame Zephyrine, I shall do my utmost. But remember, the best of us may fail in such a matter. Tut, returned her companion, I answer for the result. Have I not chosen you from thirty? Go, but be wary of the prince. I cannot think what cursed accident has brought him here tonight as if there were not a dozen balls in Paris better worth his notice than this riot of students and counter-jumpers. See him where he sits, more like a reigning emperor at home than a prince upon his holidays. Silas was again lucky. He observed a person of rather a full build, strikingly handsome, and of a very stately and courteous demeanour, seated at table with another handsome young man, several years his junior, who addressed him with conspicuous deference. The name of Prince struck gratefully on Silas's Republican hearing, and the aspect of the person to whom that name was applied exercised its usual charm upon his mind. He left Madame Zephyrine and her Englishman to take care of each other, and threading his way through the assembly, approached the table which the Prince and his confidant had honoured with their choice. I tell you, Geraldine, the former was saying, the action is madness. Yourself, I am glad to remember it, chose your brother for this perilous service and you are bound in duty to have a guard upon his conduct. He has consented to delay so many days in Paris. That was already an imprudence, considering the character of the man he has to deal with. But now, when he is within eight and forty hours of his departure, when he is within two or three days of the decisive trial, I ask you, is this a place for him to spend his time? He should be in a gallery at practice. He should be sleeping long hours and taking moderate exercise on foot. He should be on a rigorous diet without white wines or brandy. Does the dog imagine we are all playing comedy? The thing is deadly earnest, Geraldine. I know the lad too well to interfere, replied Colonel Geraldine, and well enough not to be alarmed. He is more cautious than you fancy, and of an indomitable spirit. If it had been a woman I should not say so much, but I trust the president to him and the two valets without an instant's apprehension. I am gratified to hear you say so, replied the prince. But my mind is not at rest. These servants are well-trained spies, and already has not this miscreant succeeded three times in eluding their observation and spending several hours on end in private and most likely dangerous affairs. An amateur might have lost him by accident, but if Rudolph and Jerome were thrown off the scent, it must have been done on purpose, and by a man who had a cogent reason and exceptional resources. I believe the question is now one between my brother and myself replied Geraldine with a shade of offence in his tone. I permit it to be so, Colonel Geraldine, returned Prince Florizel. Perhaps, for that very reason, you should be all the more ready to accept my counsels, but enough. That girl in yellow dances well. And the talk veered into the ordinary topics of a Paris ballroom in the carnival.
Silas remembered where he was, and that the hour was already near at hand when he ought to be upon the scene of his assignation. The more he reflected, the less he liked the prospect, and as at that moment an eddy in the crowd began to draw him in the direction of the door, he suffered it to carry him away without resistance. The eddy stranded him in a corner under the gallery, where his ear was immediately struck with the voice of Madame Zephyrine. She was speaking in French with the young man of the blonde locks, who had been pointed out by the strange Britisher not half an hour before. I have a character at stake, she said, or I would put no other condition than my heart recommends. But you have only to say so much to the porter, and he will let you go by without a word. But why this talk of debt? objected her companion. Heavens, said she, do you think I do not understand my own hotel? And she went by, clinging affectionately to her companion's arm. This put Silas in mind of his billet. Ten minutes hence, thought he, and I may be walking with as beautiful a woman as that, and even better dressed, perhaps a real lady, possibly a woman or title. And then he remembered the spelling and was a little downcast. But it may have been written by her maid, he imagined. The clock was only a few minutes from the hour, and this immediate proximity set his heart beating at a curious and rather disagreeable speed. He reflected with relief that he was in no way bound to put in an appearance. Virtue and cowardice were together, and he made once more for the door, but this time of his own accord, and battling against the stream of people which was now moving in a contrary direction. Perhaps this prolonged resistance wearied him, or perhaps he was in that frame of mind when merely to continue in the same determination for a certain number of minutes produces a reaction and a different purpose. Certainly at least he wheeled about for a third time, and did not stop until he had found a place of concealment within a few yards of the appointed place. Here he went through an agony of spirit, in which he several times prayed to God for help, for Silas had been devoutly educated. He had now not the least inclination for the meeting. Nothing kept him from flight but a silly fear lest he should be thought unmanly. But this was so powerful that it kept head against all other motives, and although it could not decide him to advance, prevented him from definitely running away. At last the clock indicated ten minutes past the hour. Young Scudamore's spirit began to rise. He peered round the corner and saw no one at the place of meeting. Doubtless his unknown correspondent had wearied and gone away. He became as bold as he had formerly been timid. It seemed to him that if he came at all to the appointment, however late, he was clear from the charge of cowardice. Nay, now he began to suspect a hoax, and actually complimented himself on his shrewdness in having suspected and outmaneuvered his mystifiers. So very idle a thing is a boy's mind. Armed with these reflections, he advanced boldly from his corner, but he had not taken above a couple of steps before a hand was laid upon his arm. He turned and beheld a lady cast in a very large mould, and with somewhat stately features, but bearing no mark of severity in her looks. I see that you are a very self-confident lady-killer, said she, for you make yourself expected, but I was determined to meet you. When a woman has once so far forgotten herself as to make the first advance, she has long ago left behind her all considerations of petty pride. Silas was overwhelmed by the size and attractions of his correspondent, and the suddenness with which she had fallen upon him. But she soon set him at his ease. She was very towardly and lenient in her behaviour. She led him on to make pleasantries, and then applauded him to the echo, and in a very short time, between blandishments and a liberal exhibition of warm brandy, she had not only induced him to fancy himself in love, but to declare his passion with the greatest vehemence. Alas, she said, I do not know whether I ought not to deplore this moment, great as is the pleasure you give me by your words. Hitherto I was alone to suffer. Now, poor boy, there will be two. I am not my own mistress. I dare not ask you to visit me at my own house, for I am watched by jealous eyes. Let me see, she added. I am older than you, although so much weaker. And while I trust in your courage and determination, I must employ my own knowledge of the world for our mutual benefit. Where do you live? He told her that he lodged in a furnished hotel and named the street and number. She seemed to reflect for some minutes with an effort of mind. I see, she said at last. You will be faithful and obedient, will you not? Silas assured her eagerly of his fidelity. Tomorrow night, then, she continued, with an encouraging smile. You must remain at home all the evening, and if any friends should visit you, dismiss them at once on any pretext that most readily presents itself. 
Your door is probably shut by ten? she asked. By eleven, answered Silas. At a quarter past eleven, pursued the lady, leave the house. Merely cry for the door to be opened, and be sure you fall into no talk with the porter, as that might ruin everything. Go straight to the corner where the Luxembourg Gardens join the boulevard. There you will find me waiting you. I trust you to follow my advice from point to point. And remember, if you fail me in only one particular, you will bring the sharpest trouble on a woman whose only fault is to have seen and loved you. I cannot see the use of all these instructions, said Silas. I believe you are already beginning to treat me as a master, she cried, tapping him with her fan upon the arm. Patience, patience, that should come in time. A woman loves to be obeyed at first, although afterwards she finds her pleasure in obeying. Do as I ask you for heaven's sake or I will answer for nothing. Indeed, now I think of it, she added, with the manner of one who has just seen further into a difficulty. I find a better plan of keeping importunate visitors away. Tell the porter to admit no one for you, except a person who may come that night to claim a debt, and speak with some feeling, as though you feared the interview, so that he may take your words in earnest. I think you may trust me to protect myself against intruders, he said, not without a little pique. That is how I should prefer the thing arranged, she answered coldly. I know you men, you think nothing of a woman's reputation. Silas blushed, and somewhat hung his head, for the scheme he had in view had involved a little vainglorying before his acquaintances. Above all, she added, do not speak to the porter as you come out. And why, said he, of all your instructions that seems to me the least important. You at first doubted the wisdom of some of the others which you now see to be very necessary, she replied. Believe me, this also has its uses. In time you will see them. And what am I to think of your affection, if you refuse me such trifles at our first interview? Silas confounded himself in explanations and apologies. In the middle of these she looked up at the clock and clapped her hands together with a suppressed scream. Heavens, she cried, is it so late? I have not an instant to lose. Alas, we poor women, what slaves we are! What have I not risked for you already? And after repeating her directions, which she artfully combined with caresses and the most abandoned looks, she bade him farewell and disappeared among the crowd. The whole of the next day Silas was filled with a sense of great importance. He was now sure she was a countess, and when evening came he minutely obeyed her orders and was at the corner of the Luxembourg Gardens by the hour appointed. No one was there. He waited nearly half an hour, looking in the face of everyone who passed or loitered near the spot. He even visited the neighboring corners of the boulevard and made a complete circuit of the garden railings. But there was no beautiful countess to throw herself into his arms. At last, and most reluctantly, he began to retrace his steps towards his hotel. On the way, he remembered the words he had heard pass between Madame Zephyrine and the blonde young man and they gave him an indefinite uneasiness. It appears, he reflected, that everyone has to tell lies to our porter. He rang the bell, the door opened before him, and the porter in his bedclothes came to offer him a light. Has he gone? inquired the porter. He, whom do you mean? asked Silas somewhat sharply, for he was irritated by his disappointment. I did not notice him go out, continued the porter, but I trust you paid him. We do not care in this house to have lodgers who cannot meet their liabilities. What the devil do you mean? demanded Silas rudely. I cannot understand a word of this farrago. The short blonde young man who came for his debt, returned the other. Him it is, I mean. Who else should it be when I had your orders to admit no one else? Why, good God, of course he never came, retorted Silas. I believe what I believe, returned the porter, putting his tongue into his cheek with a most roguish air. You are an insolent scoundrel, cried Silas, and feeling that he had made a ridiculous exhibition of asperity, and at the same time bewildered by a dozen alarms, he turned and began to run upstairs. Do you not want a light then? cried the porter. But Silas only hurried the faster, and did not pause until he had reached the seventh landing, and stood in front of his own door. There he waited a moment to recover his breath, assailed by the worst forebodings and almost dreading to enter the room. When at last he did so, he was relieved to find it dark, and to all appearance, untenanted. He drew a long breath. Here he was, home again in safety, and this should be his last folly as certainly as it had been his first. 
The matches stood on a little table by the bed, and he began to grope his way in that direction. As he moved, his apprehensions grew upon him once more, and he was pleased when his foot encountered an obstacle to find it nothing more alarming than a chair. At last he touched curtains. From the position of the window which was faintly visible, he knew he must be at the foot of the bed, and had only to feel his way along it in order to reach the table in question. He lowered his hand, but what it touched was not simply a counterpane. It was a counterpane with something underneath it, like the outline of a human leg. Silas withdrew his arm and stood a moment petrified. What, what, he thought, can this betoken? He listened intently, but there was no sound of breathing. Once more, with a great effort, he reached out the end of his finger to the spot he had already touched, but this time he leapt back half a yard and stood shivering and fixed with terror. There was something in his bed. What it was he knew not, but there was something there. It was some seconds before he could move. Then, guided by an instinct, he fell straight upon the matches, and keeping his back towards the bed, lighted a candle. As soon as the flame had kindled, he turned slowly round and looked for what he feared to see. Sure enough, there was the worst of his imaginations realised. The coverlid was drawn carefully up over the pillow, but it moulded the outline of a human body lying motionless. And when he dashed forward and flung aside the sheets, he beheld the blonde young man whom he had seen in the bullier ball the night before, his eyes open and without speculation, his face swollen and blackened, and a thin stream of blood trickling from his nostrils. Silas uttered a long, tremulous wail, dropped the candle, and fell on his knees beside the bed. Silas was awakened from the stupor into which his terrible discovery had plunged him by a prolonged but discreet tapping at the door. It took him some seconds to remember his position, and when he hastened to prevent anyone from entering it, was already too late. Dr. Noel, in a tall nightcap, carrying a lamp which lighted up his long white countenance, sidling in his gait, and peering and cocking his head like some sort of bird, pushed the door slowly open and advanced into the middle of the room. I thought I heard a cry, began the doctor, and fearing you might be unwell, I did not hesitate to offer this intrusion. Silas, with a flushed face and a fearful beating heart, kept between the doctor and the bed, but he found no voice to answer. You are in the dark, pursued the doctor, and yet you have not even begun to prepare for rest. You will not easily persuade me against my own eyesight, and your face declares most eloquently that you require either a friend or a physician. Which is it to be? Let me feel your pulse, for that is often a just reporter of the heart. He advanced to Silas, who still retreated before him backwards and sought to take him by the wrist. But the strain on the young American's nerves had become too great for endurance. He avoided the doctor with a febrile movement, and throwing himself upon the floor, burst into a flood of weeping. As soon as Dr. Noel perceived the dead man in the bed, his face darkened, and hurrying back to the door which he had left ajar, he hastily closed and double-locked it. Up! he cried, addressing Silas in strident tones. This is no time for weeping. What have you done? How came this body in your room? Speak freely to one who may be helpful. Do you imagine I would ruin you? Do you think this piece of dead flesh on your pillow can alter in any degree the sympathy with which you have inspired me? Credulous youth, the horror with which blind and unjust law regards an action never attaches to the doer in the eyes of those who love him. And if I saw the friend of my heart return to me out of seas of blood, he would be in no way changed in my affection. Raise yourself, he said. Good and ill are a chimera. There is naught in life except destiny. And however you may be circumstanced, there is one at your side who will help you to the last. Thus encouraged, Silas gathered himself together, and in a broken voice, and helped out by the doctor's interrogations, contrived at last to put him in possession of the facts. But the conversation between the prince and Geraldine he altogether omitted, as he had understood little of its purport, and had no idea that it was in any way related to his own misadventure. Alas, cried Dr. Noel, I am much abused, or you have fallen innocently into the most dangerous hands in Europe. Poor boy, what a pit has been dug for your simplicity. Into what a deadly peril have your unwary feet been conducted. This man, he said, this Englishman, whom you twice saw, and whom I suspect to be the soul of the contrivance, can you describe him? Was he young or old, 
tall or short. But Silas, who for all his curiosity had not a seeing eye in his head, was able to supply nothing but meagre generalities, which it was impossible to recognize. I would have it a piece of education in all schools, cried the doctor angrily. Where is the use of eyesight and articulate speech if a man cannot observe and recollect the features of his enemy? I, who know all the gangs of Europe, might have identified him and gained new weapons for your defense. Cultivate this art in future, my poor boy. You may find it of momentous service. The future, repeated Silas. What future is there left for me except the gallows? Youth is but a cowardly season, returned the doctor, and a man's own troubles look blacker than they are. I am old, and yet I never despair. Can I tell such a story to the police? demanded Silas. Assuredly not, replied the doctor. From what I see already of the machination in which you have been involved, your case is desperate upon that side, and for the narrow eye of the authorities you are infallibly the guilty person. And remember that we only know a portion of the plot, and the same infamous contrivers have doubtless arranged many other circumstances which would be elicited by a police inquiry, and help to fix the guilt more certainly upon your innocence. I am then lost indeed, cried Silas. I have not said so, answered Dr. Noel, for I am a cautious man. But look at this, objected Silas, pointing to the body. Here is this object in my bed, not to be explained, not to be disposed of, not to be regarded without horror. Horror? replied the doctor. No, when this sort of clock has run down, it is no more to me than an ingenious piece of mechanism to be investigated with the bistery. When blood is once cold and stagnant, it is no longer human blood. When flesh is once dead, it is no longer that flesh which we desire in our lovers and respect in our friends. The grace, the attraction, the terror have all gone from it with the animating spirit. Accustom yourself to look upon it with composure, for if my scheme is practicable, you will have to live some days in constant proximity to that which now so greatly horrifies you. Your scheme? cried Silas. What is that? Tell me speedily, Doctor, for I have scarcely courage enough to continue to exist. Without replying, Dr. Noel turned towards the bed and proceeded to examine the corpse. Quite dead, he murmured. Yes, as I had supposed, the pockets empty. Yes, and the name cut off the shirt. Their work has been done thoroughly and well. Fortunately, he is of small stature. Silas followed these words with an extreme anxiety. At last the doctor, his autopsy completed, took a chair and addressed the young American with a smile. Since I came into your room, said he, although my ears and my tongue have been so busy, I have not suffered my eyes to remain idle. I noted a little while ago that you have there in the corner one of those monstrous constructions which your fellow countrymen carry with them into all quarters of the globe. In a word, a Saratoga trunk. Until this moment I have never been able to conceive the utility of these erections. But then I began to have a glimmer. Whether it was for convenience in the slave trade, or to obviate the results of too ready an employment of the bowie knife, I cannot bring myself to decide. But one thing I see plainly. The object of such a box is to contain a human body. Surely, cried Silas, surely this is not a time for jesting. Although I may express myself with some degree of pleasantry, replied the doctor, the purport of my words is entirely serious. And the first thing we have to do, my young friend, is to empty your coffer of all that it contains. Silas, obeying the authority of Dr. Noel, put himself at his disposition. The Saratoga trunk was soon gutted of its contents, which made a considerable litter on the floor, and then, Silas taking the heels and the doctor supporting the shoulders, the body of the murdered man was carried from the bed, and after some difficulty doubled up an inserted hole into the empty box. With an effort on the part of both, the lid was forced down upon this unusual baggage, and the trunk was locked and corded by the doctor's own hand, while Silas disposed of what had been taken out between the closet and a chest of drawers. Now, said the doctor, the first step has been taken on the way to your deliverance. Tomorrow, or rather today, it must be your task to allay the suspicions of your porter, paying him all that you owe, while you may trust me to make the arrangements necessary to a safe conclusion. Meantime, follow me to my room, where I shall give you a safe and powerful opiate. For whatever you do, you must have rest. The next day was the longest in Silas's memory. It seemed as if it would never be done. He denied himself to his friends, and sat in a corner, 
with his eyes fixed upon the Saratoga trunk in dismal contemplation. His own former indiscretions were now returned upon him in kind, for the observatory had been once more opened, and he was conscious of an almost continual study from Madame Zephyrine's apartment. So distressing did this become, that he was at last obliged to block up the spy hole from his own side. And when he was thus secured from observation, he spent a considerable portion of his time in contrite tears and prayer. Late in the evening, Dr. Noel entered the room carrying in his hand a pair of sealed envelopes without address, one somewhat bulky, and the other so slim as to seem without enclosure. Silas, he said, seating himself at the table. The time has now come for me to explain my plan for your salvation. Tomorrow morning, at an early hour, Prince Florizel of Bohemia returns to London, after having diverted himself for a few days with the Parisian carnival. It was my fortune, a good while ago, to do Colonel Geraldine, his master of the horse, one of those services, so common in my profession, which are never forgotten upon either side. I have no need to explain to you the nature of the obligation under which he was laid. Suffice it to say that I knew him ready to serve me in any practicable manner. Now, it was necessary for you to gain London with your trunk unopened. To this, the Custom House seemed to oppose a fatal difficulty, but I bethought me that the baggage of so considerable a person as the Prince is, as a matter of courtesy, passed without examination by the officers of custom. I applied to Colonel Geraldine, and succeeded in obtaining a favourable answer. Tomorrow, if you go before six to the hotel where the prince lodges, your baggage will be passed over as a part of his, and you yourself will make the journey as a member of his suite. It seems to me as you speak that I have already seen both the prince and Colonel Geraldine. I even overheard some of their conversation the other evening at the Bullier Ball. It is probable enough, for the prince loves to mix with all societies, replied the doctor. Once arrived in London, he pursued, your task is nearly ended. In this more bulky envelope I have given you a letter which I dare not address, but in the other you will find the designation of the house to which you must carry it along with your box, which will there be taken from you and not trouble you any more. Alas, said Silas, I have every wish to believe you, but how is it possible? You open up to me a bright prospect, but, I ask you, is my mind capable of receiving so unlikely a solution? Be more generous, and let me further understand your meaning. The doctor seemed painfully impressed. Boy, he answered, you do not know how hard a thing you ask of me, but be it so. I am now inured to humiliation, and it would be strange if I refused you this, after having granted you so much. Know then that although I now make so quiet an appearance, frugal, solitary, addicted to study, when I was younger, my name was once a rallying cry among the most astute and dangerous spirits of London. And while I was outwardly an object for respect and consideration, my true power resided in the most secret, terrible, and criminal relations. It is to one of the persons who then obeyed me that I now address myself to deliver you from your burden. They were men of many different nations and dexterities, all bound together by a formidable oath and working to the same purposes. The trade of the association was in murder, and I who speak to you, innocent as I appear, was the chieftain of this redoubtable crew. What? cried Silas. A murderer, and one with whom murder was a trade. Can I take your hand? Ought I so much as to accept your services? Dark and criminal old man, would you make an accomplice of my youth and my distress? The doctor bitterly laughed. You are difficult to please, Mr. Scudamore, said he, but I now offer you your choice of company between the murdered man and the murderer. If your conscience is too nice to accept my aid, say so, and I will immediately leave you. Thenceforward you can deal with your trunk and its belongings as best suits your upright conscience. I own myself wrong, replied Silas. I should have remembered how generously you offered to shield me, even before I had convinced you of my innocence and I continue to listen to your counsels with gratitude. That is well, returned the doctor, and I perceive you are beginning to learn some of the lessons of experience. At the same time, resumed the New Englander, as you confess yourself accustomed to this tragical business, and the people to whom you recommend me are your own former associates and friends, could you not yourself undertake the transport of the box, and rid me at once of its detested presence? Upon my word, replied the doctor. I admire you cordially. 
If you do not think I have already meddled sufficiently in your concerns, believe me. From my heart I think the contrary. Take or leave my services as I offer them, and trouble me with no more words of gratitude, for I value your consideration even more lightly than I do your intellect. A time will come, if you should be spared to see a number of years in health of mind, when you will think differently of all this, and blush for your tonight's behaviour. So saying, the doctor arose from his chair, repeated his directions briefly and clearly, and departed from the room without permitting Silas any time to answer. The next morning, Silas presented himself at the hotel, where he was politely received by Colonel Geraldine, and relieved from that moment of all immediate alarm about his trunk and its grisly contents. The journey passed over without much incident, although the young man was horrified to overhear the sailors and railway porters complaining among themselves about the unusual weight of the prince's baggage. Silas travelled in a carriage with the valets, for Prince Florizel chose to be alone with his master of the horse. On board the steamer, however, Silas attracted his highness's attention by the melancholy of his air and attitude, as he stood gazing at the pile of baggage, for he was still full of disquietude about the future. There is a young man, observed the prince, who must have some cause for sorrow. That, replied Geraldine, is the American for whom I obtained permission to travel with your suite. You remind me that I have been remiss in courtesy, said Prince Florizel, and advancing to Silas, he addressed him with the most exquisite condescension in these words. I was charmed, young sir, to be able to gratify the desire you made known to me through Colonel Geraldine. Remember, if you please, that I shall be glad at any future time to lay you under a more serious obligation. And he then put some questions as to the political condition of America, which Silas answered with sense and propriety. You are still a young man, said the prince, but I observe you to be very serious for your years. Perhaps you allow your attention to be too much occupied with grave studies. But perhaps, on the other hand, I am myself indiscreet and touch upon a painful subject. I have certainly cause to be the most miserable of men, said Silas. Never has a more innocent person been more dismally abused. I will not ask you for your confidence, returned Prince Florizel, but do not forget that Colonel Geraldine's recommendation is an unfailing passport, and that I am not only willing but possibly more able than many others to do you a service. Silas was delighted with the amiability of this great personage, but his mind soon returned upon its gloomy preoccupations. For not even the favour of a prince to a republican can discharge a brooding spirit of its cares. The train arrived at Charing Cross, where the officers of the revenue respected the baggage of Prince Florizel in the usual manner. The most elegant equipages were in waiting, and Silas was driven, along with the rest, to the prince's residence. There Colonel Geraldine sought him out, and expressed himself pleased to have been of any service to a friend of the physician's, for whom he professed a great consideration. I hope, he added, that you will find none of your porcelain injured. Special orders were given along the line to deal tenderly with the prince's effects. And then, directing the servants to place one of the carriages at the young gentleman's disposal, and at once to charge the Saratoga trunk upon the dickey, the colonel shook hands, and excused himself on account of his occupations in the princely household. Silas now broke the seal of the envelope containing the address, and directed the stately footman to drive him to Box Court, opening off the strand. It seemed as if the place were not at all unknown to the man, for he looked startled and begged a repetition of the order. It was with a heart full of alarms that Silas mounted into the luxurious vehicle and was driven to his destination. The entrance to Box Court was too narrow for the passage of a coach. It was a mere footway between railings, with a post at either end. On one of these posts was seated a man, who at once jumped down and exchanged a friendly sign with the driver, while the footman opened the door, and inquired of Silas whether he should take down the Saratoga trunk, and to what number it should be carried. If you please, said Silas, to number three. The footman and the man who had been sitting on the post, even with the aid of Silas himself, had hard work to carry in the trunk, and before it was deposited at the door of the house in question, the young American was horrified to find a score of loiterers looking on. But he knocked with as good a countenance as he could muster up, and presented the other envelope to him who opened. He is not at home, said he, but if you will leave your letter and return tomorrow early, I shall be able to inform you whether and when he can receive your visit.
Would you like to leave your box? He added. Dearly, cried Silas, and the next moment he repented his precipitation and declared with equal emphasis that he would rather carry the box along with him to the hotel. The crowd jeered at his indecision and followed him to the carriage with insulting remarks, and Silas, covered with shame and terror, implored the servants to conduct him to some quiet and comfortable house of entertainment in the immediate neighborhood. The prince's equipage deposited Silas at the Craven Hotel in Craven Street, and immediately drove away, leaving him alone with the servants of the inn. The only vacant room, it appeared, was a little den up four pairs of stairs and looking towards the back. To this hermitage, with infinite trouble and complaint, a pair of stout porters carried the Saratoga trunk. It is needless to mention that Silas kept closely at their heels throughout the ascent and had his heart in his mouth at every corner. A single false step, he reflected, and the box might go over the banisters and land its fatal contents plainly discovered on the pavement of the hall. Arrived in the room, he sat down on the edge of his bed to recover from the agony that he had just endured. But he had hardly taken his position when he was recalled to a sense of his peril by the action of the boots, who had knelt beside the trunk and was proceeding officiously to undo its elaborate fastenings. Let it be, cried Silas. I shall want nothing from it while I stay here. You might have let it lie in the hall then, growled the man, a thing as big and heavy as a church. What you have inside I cannot fancy. If it is all money, you are a richer man than me. Money? repeated Silas in a sudden perturbation. What do you mean by money? I have no money, and you are speaking like a fool. All right, Captain, retorted the boots with a wink. There's nobody will touch your lordship's money. I'm as safe as the bank, he added. But as the box is heavy, I shouldn't mind drinking something to your lordship's health. Silas pressed two Napoleons upon his acceptance apologizing at the same time for being obliged to trouble him with foreign money and pleading his recent arrival for excuse. And the man, grumbling with even greater fervor and looking contemptuously from the money in his hand to the Saratoga trunk and back again from the one to the other, at last consented to withdraw. For nearly two days the dead body had been packed into Silas's box, and as soon as he was alone the unfortunate New Englander nosed all the cracks and openings with the most passionate attention but the weather was cool, and the trunk still managed to contain his shocking secret. He took a chair beside it, and buried his face in his hands, and his mind in the most profound reflection. If he were not speedily relieved, no question but he must be speedily discovered. Alone in a strange city, without friends or accomplices, if the doctor's introduction failed him, he was indubitably a lost New Englander. He reflected pathetically over his ambitious designs for the future. He should not now become the hero and spokesman of his native place of Bangor, Maine. He should not, as he had fondly anticipated, move on from office to office, from honor to honor. He might as well divest himself at once of all hope of being acclaimed President of the United States, and leaving behind him a statue in the worst possible style of art to adorn the Capitol at Washington. Here he was, chained to a dead Englishman doubled up inside a Saratoga trunk, whom he must get rid of or perish from the rolls of national glory. I should be afraid to chronicle the language employed by this young man to the doctor, to the murdered man, to Madame Zephyrin, to the boots of the hotel, to the prince's servants, and, in a word, to all who had been ever so remotely connected with his horrible misfortune. He slunk down to dinner about seven at night, but the yellow coffee room appalled him. The eyes of the other diners seemed to rest on his with suspicion, and his mind remained upstairs with the Saratoga trunk. When the waiter came to offer him cheese, his nerves were already so much on edge that he leaped halfway out of his chair and upset the remainder of a pint of ale upon the tablecloth. The fellow offered to show him to the smoking room when he had done, and although he would have much preferred to return at once to his perilous treasure, he had not the courage to refuse, and was shown downstairs to the black gas-lit cellar, which formed, and possibly still forms, the divan of the Craven Hotel. Two very sad betting men were playing billiards, attended by a moist, consumptive marker, and for the moment Silas imagined that these were the only occupants of the apartment. But at the next glance his eye fell upon a person smoking in the farthest corner, with lowered eyes and a most respectable and modest aspect. He knew at once that he had seen the face before, and in spite of the entire change of clothes, 
recognized the man whom he had found seated on a post at the entrance to Box Court, and who had helped him to carry the trunk to and from the carriage. The New Englander simply turned and ran, nor did he pause until he had locked and bolted himself into his bedroom. There, all night long, a prey to the most terrible imaginations, he watched beside the fatal box full of dead flesh. The suggestion of the boots that his trunk was full of gold inspired him with all manner of new terrors, if he so much as dared to close an eye, and the presence in the smoking room and under an obvious disguise of the loiterer from Box Court convinced him that he was once more the centre of obscure machinations. Midnight had sounded some time, when, impelled by uneasy suspicions, Silas opened his bedroom door and peered into the passage. It was dimly illuminated by a single jet of gas, and some distance off he perceived a man sleeping on the floor in the costume of an hotel underservant. Silas drew near the man on tiptoe. He lay partly on his back, partly on his side, and his right forearm concealed his face from recognition. Suddenly, while the American was still bending over him, the sleeper removed his arm and opened his eyes, and Silas found himself once more face to face with the loiterer of Box Court. Good night, sir, said the man pleasantly. But Silas was too profoundly moved to find an answer, and regained his room in silence. Towards morning, worn out by apprehension, he fell asleep on his chair, with his head forward on the trunk. In spite of so constrained an attitude and such a grisly pillow, his slumber was sound and prolonged, and he was only awakened at a late hour and by a sharp tapping at the door. He hurried to open and found the boots without. You are the gentleman who called yesterday at Box Court, he asked. Silas, with a quaver, admitted that he had done so. Then this note is for you, added the servant, proffering a sealed envelope. Silas tore it open and found inside the words, Twelve o'clock. He was punctual to the hour. The trunk was carried before him by several stout servants, and he was himself ushered into a room, where a man sat warming himself before the fire with his back towards the door. The sound of so many persons entering and leaving, and the scraping of the trunk as it was deposited upon the bare boards, were alike unable to attract the notice of the occupant, and Silas stood waiting in an agony of fear, until he should deign to recognize his presence. Perhaps five minutes had elapsed before the man turned leisurely about and disclosed the features of Prince Florizel of Bohemia. So, sir, he said with great severity, this is the manner in which you abuse my politeness. You join yourselves to persons of condition, I perceive, for no other purpose than to escape the consequences of your crimes, and I can readily understand your embarrassment when I addressed myself to you yesterday. Indeed, cried Silas. I am innocent of everything except misfortune. And in a hurried voice and with the greatest ingenuousness, he recounted to the prince the whole history of his calamity. I see I have been mistaken, said his highness, when he had heard him to an end. You are no other than a victim, and since I am not to punish you, may be sure I shall do my utmost to help. And now, he continued, to business. Open your box at once, and let me see what it contains. Silas changed color. I almost fear to look upon it, he exclaimed. Nay, replied the prince, have you not looked at it already? This is a form of sentimentality to be resisted. The sight of a sick man, whom we can still help, should appeal more directly to the feelings than that of a dead man who is equally beyond help or harm, love or hatred. Nerve yourself, Mr. Scudamore. And then, seeing that Silas still hesitated, I do not desire to give another name to my request, he added. The young American awoke as if out of a dream, and with a shiver of repugnance addressed himself to loose the straps and open the lock of the Saratoga trunk. The prince stood by, watching with a composed countenance and his hands behind his back. The body was quite stiff, and it cost Silas a great effort, both moral and physical, to dislodge it from its position and discover the face. Prince Florizel started back with an exclamation of painful surprise. Alas, he cried. You little know, Mr. Scudamore, what a cruel gift you have brought me. This is a young man of my own suite, the brother of my trusted friend, and it was upon matters of my own service that he has thus perished at the hands of violent and treacherous men. Poor Geraldine, he went on as if to himself, in what words am I to tell you of your brother's fate? How can I excuse myself in your eyes, or in the eyes of God, for the presumptuous schemes that led him to this bloody and unnatural death? Ah, Florizel, 
Florizel, when will you learn the discretion that suits mortal life and be no longer dazzled with the image of power at your disposal? Power, he cried. Who is more powerless? I look upon this young man whom I have sacrificed, Mr. Scudamore, and feel how small a thing it is to be a prince. Silas was moved at the sight of his emotion. He tried to murmur some consolatory words and burst into tears. The prince, touched by his obvious intention, came up to him and took him by the hand. Command yourself, said he. We have both much to learn, and we shall both be better men for today's meeting. Silas thanked him in silence with an affectionate look. Write me the address of Dr. Noel on this piece of paper, continued the prince, leading him towards the table. And let me recommend you, when you are again in Paris, to avoid the society of that dangerous man. He has acted in this matter on a generous inspiration. That, I must believe. Had he been privy to young Geraldine's death, he would never have dispatched the body to the care of the actual criminal. The actual criminal, repeated Silas in astonishment. Even so, returned the prince. This letter, which the disposition of Almighty Providence has so strangely delivered into my hands, was addressed to no less a person than the criminal himself, the infamous president of the Suicide Club. Seek to pry no further in these perilous affairs, but content yourself with your own miraculous escape, and leave this house at once. I have pressing affairs, and must arrange at once about this poor clay, which was so lately a gallant and handsome youth. Silas took a grateful and submissive leave of Prince Florizel, but he lingered in Box Court until he saw him depart in a splendid carriage on a visit to Colonel Henderson of the police. Republican as he was, the young American took off his hat with almost a sentiment of devotion to the retreating carriage. And the same night he started by rail on his return to Paris. Here, observes my Arabian author, is the end of the history of the physician and the Saratoga trunk. Omitting some reflections on the power of providence, highly pertinent in the original, but little suited to our Occidental taste, I shall only add that Mr. Scudamore has already begun to mount the ladder of political fame, and by last advices was the sheriff of his native town. Thank you for listening. If you like our recordings, consider liking this video and subscribing to our channel so you don't miss any more audiobooks.